2 Corinthians chapter 11. We won't get here for a while, and I will be starting a little sober, not just because of what we have observed, but just due to the nature of the message. So it'll be a little sober beginning, and then we'll bring it around. If you're visiting with us today, it's an honor to have you with us. Uh, If you're not a Christian or if you're not sure if you're a Christian, uh, this message may seem a little hard for you to grasp, but stay with us because it will summarize what Christianity is uh, as I get going here. But if you don't know me personally, if you don't know me very well, I'm a Psalm 90 guy. I'm a Psalm 90 guy. If you're not really sure what Psalm 90 is, it's the Psalm of Moses, and he talked about how the years of our days are three score and ten. He says if by reason of strength they be four score, but they'll be full of labor and sorrow. But then he talks about how our life is soon cut off and we fly away. He's talking about our mortality, how we are all, of course, mortal, and there is an end to our life. And Moses takes that knowledge that we all know, even though we tend to overlook it or avoid it or push it aside, and he prays, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom, meaning Moses said, God, help us to be more conscious of our mortality and to know that the calendar is losing days every day throughout our lifetime so that we would not waste our time, so that we would not ignore the reality that we don't have forever to do the right things. I preached a message entitled, Running Out of Time, uh, just a few months ago. I am a Psalm 90 guy. Now, Some people in my life don't like that, primarily my mother and my daughters. Um, My wife has accepted the fact that I'm very much a Psalm 90 guy. I will often tell her when I'm not here, this is what you have to be aware of. And I have a file called uh, In My Absence, and, and that has all of the information she should need to continue on to pay all the bills and to know all the things that she needs to know. And we have a burial plot. And, and that's not me being morbid as a young man. That's me being biblical. We should always set our house in order and prepare our families for our absence. And I suppose for me it's easier, given my profession, um, to be totally transparent with you. Uh, many of you, of course, know uh, that this church has suffered another loss, and I was at another graveside. And you know, while the pallbearers were handling Nancy Cress's body with great care, um, my heart was heavy for the family, of course, but I stand next to a mound of dirt, which is common, of course, when you're in a cemetery. And I don't, I don't overlook that. I don't, I don't ignore it. I don't push it away. I don't deny it. That's the end of all men no matter who we are, and that includes me. That includes you. You say, why am I mentioning that? Well, I am getting on a plane this Friday. Actually, two planes this Friday. And then 10 days later, two more planes. And I'm traveling a great distance with 29 other people uh, from this church. We'll be gone for the next two Sundays. We get the privilege to go to the Holy Land. But listen, I'm not afraid of flying. I love flying. I don't think about my mortality as an imminent thing when I'm flying, but I definitely think about it when I get into a big piece of metal that goes up tens of thousands of feet in the air, piloted by, maintained by human beings who are flawed. So I think about and I'm always amazed. I hope you are. Don't ever get used to looking up in the sky and seeing this, this big machine flying over you. That's that's amazing. I can't get a paper airplane to stay in the air a few feet off the ground for more than 10 feet, right? It's just, it's fascinating to me. And I think it one of the most amazing accomplishments of, accomplishments of man that when a plane does crash, it is a global story for weeks, like it shouldn't happen. I mean, it's amazing to me that all, all these planes every day are in the, in the sky and never come down. It's fascinating. But anyways, when I take off, I always thank the Lord for a great ride. I often think about my children, who are the ones I'm most concerned about. I almost always fly with my wife, so she'll be with me. Now, I'm not trying to scare the the family members of those who are not going to Israel with us in any way, as though I know something you don't know. But because I'm a Psalm 90 guy... I'm always conscious of that final phrase, that final statement, that final charge, that final message. I live in a populated area, so I hear ambulances and police cars often. I 
I am by a fire department, so I hear the siren. And when my family isn't home and I hear that, my mind instantly goes to, I hope that wasn't one of my loved ones. Now, again, I'm not a morbid person, but I'm a realistic person. And I want to make sure that whenever I leave my family or, or they leave me, that there is some positive message or a good atmosphere. It really helps you keep things right, by the way. And when I leave the church before a large trip, I often think about the potential of a final sermon or a possible final farewell message, which is why it's not uncommon for me on a Sunday night to say I love you and that should I not return, keep on keeping on. It's not me being funny. It's not me being sentimental. It's me being realistic. And because I want you to do that, I want you to keep on. I want you to keep going. So... Today is a farewell message, just in case. And it's a hard message, truthfully. It's going to be very pointed. It's going to be even difficult to absorb. But should I not return from Israel because of any number of issues, whether it's travel or medical, and that can happen, right? We're not supposed to boast ourselves of tomorrow. We know not what a day may bring forth. But should this be my final message to you, I hope it will mean something for the days to come. Before we even get into 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, we're going to read on the screen just a few phrases that Paul the Apostle wrote to his son Timothy in the faith. It wasn't his biological son, it was his spiritual son. And uh, Timothy was a Psalm 90 guy also. In fact, the second letter he wrote to his son was a letter of departure. He's saying, hey, I'm ready to depart. My departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And so I'm heading out. My life is about to end. I don't know when, but it's about to end. So here are some final things. He was preparing him in his absence. And he said these words in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said... This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. He says, hey, I'm going to be gone. You're going to be around. Just know that in the last days there's going to be some difficult times for you and for the church. And he described people, one of which of uh, the descriptions was that they'll be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. They'll have a form of godliness. They'll look religious, but they'll deny the power thereof. They won't commit entirely to their faith. He also said in verse number six, you can see it behind me, he said, for of this sort, the people that are religious but not really devout are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins. That's a fascinating phrase. I believe, based on that phrase almost alone, that we are living in the time that Paul was telling Timothy about, perilous times. Yeah, of course, people are lovers of pleasures more than they are lovers of God, but now more than ever, women in particular are sitting on their phones and computers, and they're allowing men who are religious but not biblical come into their lives through YouTube and Facebook and TikTok and through all these other blogs and vlogs, and they're leading women astray. Verse number seven, they are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then in verse 13, he tells Timothy this. He said, but evil men and seducers, please remember that this morning, shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. So he was warning his son of the faith, I'm not going to be here forever. You're going to have some tough times ahead as a pastor. People are going to be this way, and this is going to happen. It's not going to be very easy. He says in chapter 4, preach the word. He again says, for the time will come when they, believers, will not endure sound doctrine. But instead, he says, they're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. How do you do that? How do you heap yourselves teachers? Well, you get books and books and books, or you go online and get favorite authors and favorite preachers and teachers. And then in verse 4 of chapter 4, Paul tells his son in the faith that they shall turn away their ears from the truth, people who are believers, and shall be turned unto fables. Fables are not true. They're fictitious. In the first letter to uh, to Timothy, Paul says this, In verse number one, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, look at it now, giving heed 
to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, don't interpret that doctrines of devils as the satanic cult and there's a satanic Bible and a satanic teaching. No, Christians don't jump into Satanism. But Christians, Paul said, by this prophecy, they will give heed to seducing spirits, meaning they're talking the same talk, but they're leading you down a different path. And the doctrines of devils, these are devils who are giving truth with fable, and people are falling for it. Seduction, spiritual seductions. And so Paul tells young Timothy in verse 7 of that chapter to refuse profane and old wives' fables, And then he says, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And the next verse, which is still up behind me, it's fascinating to me because then he goes into bodily exercise profiteth little. Now why would Paul be writing about going to the gym or about lifting weights, about running? We're talking about spiritual seduction, doctrines of devils, and he says, you know, be godly, that's a good exercise. And then he says, bodily bodily exercise profiteth a little. It's almost like that was the topic of the day, the thing that everybody was aiming for, and he's like, "It's, it's got a place, but that's not what we're here for. Now, it's not the message today, but it can be. I'll just give you some food for thought. Wellness is the spirit of the day. But I'll leave that for another time. 2 Timothy 2, Paul says to Timothy again, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So it's clear that Paul, before he departs from the world, is preparing his son of the faith, Timothy, to be ready for some trying times where people will all be, will be all about knowledge, but never really get it. They'll reject the truth and they'll go to fables and they'll be seduced. So they'll be seduced by the doctrines of devils. No church is standing up today and saying, turn in your Bible to this chapter and we're going to talk about the doctrine of devils and and people are going to be okay with that. So it's coming in on the back end. It's coming in cloaked with something. Paul is warning Timothy of a coming wave of seducing spirits and how it would ultimately create a new breed of Christian. And today I want to essentially warn you of what I think is no longer a coming wave of seducing spirits, but a presence of seducing spirits. You and I are living in a day and age where seducing spirits are alive and well. They are no longer a future threat, they are an active threat, and they are presently active in the body of Christ. And they are creating a new form of Christianity, which I will call today Christianity 2.0, and I'll explain in just a little bit why I call it that. But may, may there be no mistaking, this is not a new and improved version of Christianity. Today's church is not putting out uh, more dedicated believers than in Paul's Christianity. It is not putting out today more committed and more convicted believers than Paul did in the first century. Somebody sent me a cool meme this week, and it was, if Paul saw the church today, we'd be getting a letter. (laughs) That's true. Showing signs of improvement on the way to hospital now. So praise the Lord for that. Keep, keep praying. Uh, Pastor C, if you, get, if you can get an update by the end of the service and get that to me before I step off the platform, folks would appreciate it. I don't know if you've read Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is not Paul's day and age. That was hundreds of years later, but if you've ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs and then compared it to the modern church today, uh, you would, I think, agree with me that this is not a new and improved Christianity. And, And I speak this to my own disappointment and to my own shame, given that I'm a pastor in the modern church. But the problem with Christianity 2.0 is not that we don't love Jesus or that we don't have a passion for Christ It is not even that we aren't on some level committed to Christ. I think the problem with Christianity 2.0 is that we have failed to discern the seducing spirits among us. 
We have failed to recognize that there are spirits at work that are intending to harm our faith and to hurt our churches. Not every Christian idea is a good idea. Not every feeling is a good feeling. Not every counsel is good counsel. Not every social media post by just anybody is a good post. Not every YouTube video is a good video. And frankly, not every Christian is a Christian. Not every internet ministry is a good ministry. John the Apostle would write these powerful words. He said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. So today I want to expose what seducing spirits are telling you and me in the church today. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to read a pretty good amount of this, so I need you to put your thinking cap on, and I know there's distractions, they're healthy distractions, I know you're praying, please keep praying, but do your best if you can to follow with me in this passage, it's very important, and uh, I hope you'll be blessed from it this morning. I want to open all of our eyes to what I think is happening around, all around us. So now Paul, the same guy who wrote to Timothy, is addressing the Corinthian church. They're a carnal church. They're, they're a baby church. They are, um, you know, they're having all kinds of issues from sexuality to doctrine. And they in particular have had false doctrine enter into the church because they've struggled with vetting, with uh, being able to discern who's right and who's wrong. So let's read together, and I'll explain as we go through this what Paul is saying. Verse number one, Paul writes to these believers, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly. So he is going to be a little exaggerative in this chapter. He's going to be a little aggressive in, in writing to them. He's going to do something that nobody should ever do. In just a few verses, he's going to list why he's a credible, a credible voice for them to listen to. Because they're, they're struggling with false teachers, and he's going to list why he should be listened to. And normally you never do that, because that's an emphasis on self. That's you saying, listen to me, I'm, I'm the right voice. He's calling that folly, because it's, it's not ideal. But you'll see why he has to do that. Verse number two, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband meaning engaged, spiritually speaking, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So the reason he's going to be a little aggressive, even a little exaggerative, is because he is like a spiritual father to this church. And he has essentially said to them, you are in a betrothal, an espousal, an engagement with Jesus Christ. He's, he's your groom, you're the bride. One day you're gonna come together in heaven and, and I gotta get you there. It's my job as your father to watch over you spiritually, to keep from you all those bad guys in the neighborhood, those bad spiritual guys, and I'm gonna get you uh, to the altar. So I'm really invested in you, Corinthian church, and for that reason, I'm gonna tell you some things you don't wanna hear. Verse number three, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Oh, now, this is fascinating. This is, to me, so fascinating. Paul, using this father-daughter relationship, he brings in now Adam and Eve, Eve who was married to Adam. Adam had a command that he was to follow as well as Eve was, and it was very simple. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Very simple. There's no ands, ifs, buts. There's no conditions. There's no, well, this happens. You can do that. Very simple. Do whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want. Just don't eat that fruit ever. Period. I, I mean, it's just super simple right there. And, and Paul says, I'm worried about you, Corinthian church, because like with Eve, Satan may be subtle enough to corrupt your minds to get you thinking bad thoughts and then steal from you the simplicity that's in Christ. It was very simple for Eve. Just don't eat the fruit. Well, what does Satan do? He doesn't come and say, God doesn't exist. No, he didn't try to convince her to be an atheist. He didn't come in and say, you know, uh, God never even made you. God didn't make this tree. He didn't do that at all. He said, no, I know God exists and I know he gave you a commandment. I accept the fact that there's a Bible and that there's a God. But, you know, why was it really written? 
I mean, have you thought about it? Because maybe God just doesn't want you to be like him, knowing good and evil. You know what, Eve? Maybe God doesn't want you to do that fruit because he'll know you'll get all this wisdom and then think about what that wisdom could do for you. It could make you powerful. And so now she took this simple command, black and white, yes and no, do and don't, and she began to think, well, you know, you got a point there. You got a point there. I mean, it's maybe, yeah, why? My, my Adam's always working. Just think if I knew more, I could convince him not to work. We could be happy together. It's good for him, good for us, be good for our kids. And eventually she was tricked by subtlety. And Paul says, listen, there are false prophets and false teachers seducing spirits who are going to trick you out of the simplicity of Christ into thinking deeper than you need to think, and then you'll get off track. Verse number four. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Are you seeing what's going on here? Paul is saying that the Corinthian church is going to have people come and preach, not Satan, uh, not another religion. They're going to come and preach Jesus, which who doesn't love Jesus in a, in a Christian church? Uh, they're going to come and preach uh, the Holy Spirit. Well, who doesn't love the Holy Spirit? They're going to preach the gospel. Woo, the gospel. Well, well, they're just different variations of Christ. Just slightly different modifications to the Holy Spirit. Just a little adaptation of the gospel. And they would accept it. They would receive it through the subtlety of the message. And Paul says, I don't want you to do any of that. You see, seducing spirits speak the right language. If a woman wants to seduce a man, she doesn't come at him with language that is foreign. She uses language that seems okay. If a predator tries to seduce a child, that predator uses language that that child thinks is okay. You want some candy. That language is good for that child. And so spiritual seducing spirits will use language that we we like, Jesus and gospel and spirit. Verse 23, here's where Paul gets into his folly. Are they, these false teachers, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. Ready? I am more. Meaning, I'm more of a minister than they are. Now, that's foolish because that sounds proud and arrogant. But he's trying to let them know that he is credible and these false teachers are not. He says, I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes or whippings, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. (laughs) I've been pronounced dead multiple times. Have they? This is what Paul's doing, verse number 24. Of the Jews received, uh, of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes, save one. He's been whipped 195 times. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. My goodness, verse 27. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Verse 28, besides those things that are without, besides all that that has happened to my body, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Meaning I have cared for these churches, I've bore the burdens of these people, these churches, the stress, uh, the sorrow of losses and, and the sorrow of spiritual failures and all these physical things happen to me and yes, all these emotional and spiritual things happen to me. And, he, and he's saying to the Corinthian church, none of your false prophets, none of your internet preachers, none of your books that you're reading, those people haven't gone through what I've gone through because they don't have the real deal. They have seducing spirits. I'm the real deal. Listen to me. That's what he's kind of saying. Paul was very concerned that the Corinthian church was going to give heed to seducing spirits who come in the form of people. And in pointing out his credentials, he revealed what true Christianity is. And this is what we need to get now. 
True Christianity isn't easy. True Christianity isn't always fun. True Christianity isn't about us. This is true Christianity boiled down. Oh, we got, we got ahead of ourselves. There we go. This is true Christianity. If you're not a Christian today and you want to know what Christianity is all about, this is what it's supposed to be. Verse 26, Jesus says in Luke 14, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So when you come to be a Christian, we actually ask you to hate your father and mother. No, we don't. In a parallel passage, Jesus says no one can love his father or mother, brethren or sisters more than me. So Jesus is saying, if you're in Christianity, I've got to be the most important person to you, hands down. It can't be close. You can't love your wife, your husband, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your children, anything close to the way you love me. That bothers some of us. Jesus would go on to say in that sermon, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Meaning if you don't deny yourself and put yourself way down the list, you can't be a part of it. So you have to, you have to forsake in many ways your emotional t- uh, strings to family, your uh, dependence on the flesh. And then he goes on in verse 33 to say, Likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So family, flesh, furnishings, all beneath Christ for it to be true Christianity. What is Paul saying? Please, please get this. He is saying it's not that complicated. Christianity isn't about our well-being. It is about Jesus Christ. He said, don't let those seducing spirits corrupt your thought process. Don't let those seducing spirits complicate your mindset. Christianity is pretty simple. And yet here we are in 2023, and it's my my observation for what it's worth that modern Christianity has unknowingly fell for the seducing spirits and that many Christians have begun to see Christianity as only good for us as long as it makes our lives better better. Well, I go to church because I go to church and my marriage will be better. I read my Bible because my family will be better. I obey all the things the Bible tells me because my health will be better. I give to God because my finances will be better. But when I put that next to Paul the Apostle who talked about perils of perils of perils of perils of perils of perils, you know, fastings often, nakedness and, and whippings and beaten and pronounced dead. And, and I just don't see how Paul's well-being got any better because of Christianity. And yet he did not. He did not in any way back off of the call to serve Christ for his life. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, one chapter over very quickly with me. If you would, please, I need to move rather quickly. But he continues this this idea to the Corinthian church that I'm a credible voice, please listen to me. He said, I went to the third heaven. I was, I was in front of God somehow, some way. I don't get it, but he gave me revelations and he gave me information to share with you. And because of that information, God gave me an illness, a thorn in the flesh to humble me. Verse number seven, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. He said, I begged God in verse eight three times to take it from me, but God said, no way, Jose. Verse number nine, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul concludes, most gladly, therefore, will I take glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10, therefore, In light of all of this, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. Note it now, three words, for Christ's sake. Please do not listen to the seducing spirits of our day and age. 
Christianity is about Christ, not us. Don't be tricked in thinking, well, you know, if we do it all right, it makes us better. If we do it all right, uh, we'll be better for it. No, 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 no. It is not about us at any point of the day. It is always about Jesus, past, present, and future. We just get blessed to get in on it because of his grace. Seducing spirits will make you think that Jesus wants us healthy, wealthy, and on a beach somewhere. They'll make you think Christianity exists for you. And yet Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So it's just not that complicated. But seducing spirits are stealing the simplicity found in Christ. They are complicating Christianity to the point where now, today, we think of our faith in a very sophisticated way. I have everything figured out. I have, it, I have my time balanced, my money balanced, my family balanced, my health balanced. I can do this, that, and go to church. I can do this, that, and, and serve God, and I've got it all figured out. I've got my children figured out, and my community's figured out, and we, we, we act like we have it all figured out, when in reality, we are nowhere near Paul's Christianity. Christianity 1.0 was about how we can serve Jesus, where Christianity 2.0 is about how Jesus can serve us. Ever get an app or a Windows update that does it automatically and you just beg to go back to the previous version? And you'll, you'll do anything to go back, but you can't? That's Christianity 2.0. We have to somehow get back to Christianity 1.0. I called it Christianity 2.0 because you probably already could see it, but seducing spirits of our age will use a particular word to get you overthinking Christianity. They'll use a three-letter word to corrupt our minds from the simplicity of Jesus, a three-letter word that will get us thinking about us And the benefit we're supposed to get from Christianity just like Satan did in the garden. You realize that commandment had nothing to do with Eve's well-being. It had everything to do with her obedience to God. And Satan was able to trick her into thinking it could benefit her somehow, some way. Seducing spirits are doing the very same thing with Christianity. But the three-letter word that they are using, and it's a simple word, It's two. What do I mean by that? Let me give you seven points. Do not be alarmed. They're not seven points. They're seven statements. But a seducing spirit might say to you, the archaic Bible is just too difficult to read. Would God ever say that? Would the Holy Spirit ever say that? Would Paul the Apostle ever say that? No, but there are seducing spirits that might get you thinking, you know, this is just too hard to read. I'll just listen to the pastor. I'll listen to the preacher. I'll go online and see what somebody says about it just to get you away from the word of God. There are millions, it seems like, of different variations of scripture, hundreds of versions. And you know, you cannot make it so easy, no matter what you do, unless you steal the substance. We keep rewording it, but it's still difficult by divine design. If you could read this like a novel, you'd read it once, set it down, and never go back. It's difficult because there's substance to it. Well, Paul, if you said, Paul, it's too difficult to read, he'd say, ah, I'll read it for Christ's sake. Have you ever heard this? The four church services are too many to attend. If Paul were here right now and we say, hey, Paul, we have a 10 o'clock Bible class, an 11 o'clock morning worship, a 6 p.m. evening worship on Sundays, and then we come back on Wednesdays at 6.30. Does anyone here think Paul would say, man, that's a lot. You guys come to church too much. Does anyone think if Jesus came down and we told him the same schedule and Jesus said, well, I applaud you folks at this church, you guys do too much. Does anyone think that? 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 25 says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. He went on, he went on to say, so much the more you need to get together as you see the day approaching when seducing spirits are saying, skip church, don't go to church, don't go to as many services. It's just too many to attend. The word of God is saying, no, you should be coming to church more as the day approaches. You say, well, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For Christ's sake. Ever hear a whisper in your ear? The extra church ministries are too busy to embrace. Church shouldn't dominate our lives. I mean, it should be a part of our lives, but it shouldn't dominate our lives. Christianity 1.0, and I read, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their bread with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Yeah, if it's about us, we absolutely have to do a better job of balancing our time, no question. But if it's about Christ, for Christ's sake. I'd rather come to church every day and serve them than be whipped 195 times. We have it easy peasy. Don't read into this too much. I'm a Psalm 90 guy, meaning this may be my final message. And I want to prepare you for the next preacher who will be more ambitious than I will who, will, who will lead you more courageously than I will lead you. But you'll be tempted to say the ambitious preacher is too demanding to follow. Be careful with the word too. I don't think it belongs in the same conversation as it pertains to our service and worship to Jesus Christ. You might hear a seducing spirit online or in a book or in your ears say the 10% tithe is too much to give. Maybe it is. You don't have to do it. I'm not here to tell you you need to do any of these things. I'm just trying to expose to you the things that you might hear or have already heard that are not coming from heaven. They're not coming from Paul the Apostle. They're not coming from Jesus Christ. If you told Paul, I give 10% of my paycheck to God, he would say, that's it? If you whined to Paul and said, I got to give God 10%, he'd say, you keep the 90%, man. Jesus gave it all. But seducing spirits, why don't you to think that a little more through? Like, boy, just think what I could do with more money. I could bless my family. I wouldn't have to work so much. Then I could be around and my wife would be happy and our kids would get vacations more often and we'd raise good kids because I'd have a relationship with them. And those, are, those sound good and a lot of that is good. Seducing spirits give you another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. Why do we give no matter how much we give, no matter when we give? For Christ's sake. Maybe you've thought this or heard this or discussed it with other people, but that clicky congregation, and it is, they all are, don't be fooled. It's too judgmental to love. When Jesus said, love one another, it was simple. There is not love one another except for when they talk bad about you. Love one another except when they don't invite you to their outing. Love one another except for fill in the blank. No, 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 no. It's simple. Don't let Satan complicate it. Don't let seducing spirits trick you into thinking you don't have to love the body of Christ because they're flawed people. There is no any way out of loving one another. It's a command. It's our chief responsibility, amen? amen? But it's not easy. So why do we do it? Why do we put up with each other for years and years and years? Are you ready? For Christ's sake! I mean, isn't he worth it? Number seven. The perfect will of God is just too hard to accept. God says to you he wants you to be single. Or God says to you he wants you to get married. Equally can be difficult. 
Or God says to you, I want you to stay put right where you are, but it's a blue state. God says, yeah, stay right there. I want you to stay in that church, but you don't know who's there. It's too hard. The seducing spirits will say, there's a way out of this. You can do still the right thing in a, in a different place. When God just says, follow me, follow me. And sometimes it's very hard, but it's never, and it should never be too hard because of Christ. Now this is, I'm, I'm almost done, so sit tight for two more seconds. It's been my observation as a pastor in this small part of the world that when Christians get too busy, and by the way, we are all too busy. But when we get too busy, it's easy for church and ministry to be blamed for making them too busy. Not working all the extra overtime. Not working a second job. Not having a big, beautiful house that requires a lot of time to maintain. Not having a fleet of cars and, and toys to maintain. Not having excessive fam, family activities. What I'm saying, and none of those are wrong, by the way. But why do we default to when we're too busy? It's the church. The seducing spirits of our age are very skilled at applying that word to to Christianity while sheltering it from playing too much golf or from working too much or from saving too much money, or from spending too much money, or from relaxing too much, or even having too much family time. I know that sounds like it's a bad statement to make, but can it ever be too much for Christ? Right now in our midst, I'm certain that people are thinking somewhere along the lines, man, he is being too hard, or at least too unreasonable. I'm a Psalm 90 guy. I may be gone. But I want you to be aware of what you're up against. Try the spirits. John said, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. I've looked through my concordance. Paul never used the word to to temper anyone's service to Jesus Christ. For Paul, you couldn't give enough time to Christ. For Paul, you couldn't give enough of your talent to Jesus. For Paul, you couldn't give enough of your treasure to Christ. And he wasn't against working. He taught about it so that you could use what you earn to help the poor. He wasn't against family. He taught on marriage and children. He didn't have any, but he didn't want those to become gods, those to become a problem for your service to Christ. And when Christianity has to work with our schedule, with our marriage, with our family, with our ambitions, with our plans, we have officially entered Christianity 2.0. When I was preparing this message this week, my wife, who was out at a job, texted me a link to a song by Halal. It's called Oh, How He Loves Us. It's a beautiful song. If you've never heard it, you should get it. And there's a line there that says, if grace were an ocean, if grace, picture this now, if grace were an ocean, meaning the grace of God upon us, if grace were an ocean, we're all drowning. This old rugged cross, when we put this at the front of our lives, is it ever too much? Will any of us be ashamed when we stand before God because we gave too many of our hours to the scriptures, too many of our hours to the service of Christ, too many hours of our service to him through the local church, too many of our hours worshiping him? Or, or may we look at the lives we lived and determine, wow, wow, 
Let me just back up and be personal. People will often say to me, PK, you're too busy. You're too busy. You're too busy. You're going to burn out. Listen, I get my time. I've watched all the Bills games this year. Now, I know it's, like, it's kind of comic. I didn't watch the one I was in California. I really suffered for Jesus and went to a conference. But, but I found time to watch the Bills games, which is fine. But we trick ourselves into thinking we're too busy serving God. Well, no, we're just too busy. We do what we want to do. We find time to go hunting when it's hunting season. We go find t- time to go shopping when we want to buy something. We've, we find time to watch our shows when we want to watch them. That's all fine. What am I saying? Just shut the door on the seducing spirits when they say church is too much. God is too much. Jesus is asking too much. Shut the door. Paul said, for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake, I'd rather have infirmities. I'd rather have illnesses. For Christ's sake, I'd rather be imprisoned. Why? Because Jesus died for him. Jesus bore his sin and his shame for him. Jesus gave his life for Paul. Paul could never give back to Jesus what Jesus gave to Paul. We have but one life, one life to live to give back to Christ. May it never be too much for us all till the Lord tarries. Let's stand.